Aloha and welcome to Crossroads in Learning. I am your host, Keisha King. Here we have conversations that are real and relevant, especially as they pertain to education. And boy, what a topic education is right now. For many across the state of Hawaii, today was the first day of school in some format, whether you were an online student, in-person student, or if you are just preparing for your first classes that will happen this week, this is the time to talk about a hot topic, education. With us today, we have a guest who is an educator in the classroom for Hawaii Department of Education, Kevin Sledge. He's gonna share with us all the activities and teachings that he is involved in. And then maybe we'll get his opinion on the DOE versus the governor and the mayor and the HSTA. There's a lot going on in education right now. And we want to say, everyone, please take a deep breath. We know that this is something that is challenging, but it is possible to handle this. And so we're excited to have you with us today. Please welcome with me, Kevin Sledge. Aloha, Kevin. Aloha. <laughs> All right. So good to see you. Kevin and I are on uh, several, well, at least one group together. Um, and we chit chat about the things happening in education here in the state and across the country. Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us where you're from and what you do. Okay. Um, of course, my name is Kevin Sledge. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina. I've been here in Hawaii for six years now. I'm in my seventh year. Um, I've been teaching for six years, again, in my seventh year here um, at Waipahu High School. I came to Hawaii as a member of Teach for America, if you're familiar with the organization. Um, it's a two-year commitment to teach in um, high needs schools all across the country. So you apply and you choose different regions that you'd like to um, possibly teach in. One of my first picks was Hawaii, yeah. Um, also one of my first picks was Miami. And I was sure that they would send me to Miami because of my background in um, Spanish. I have a um, master's in Spanish, bachelor's and a master's, uh, master's in Spanish. Um, so I was sure that they would send me to Miami, um, and I love Miami, but I put Hawaii because I've always been fascinated by the place and the people, and um, prior to coming with Teach for America, I had not been to Hawaii before, but um, just things that I had read and things that I had seen and, and you know, media and TV, I was just inspired to want to learn more about the place and the people, and so I put that down on my application for Teach for America. Um, and happily, they sent me here and, and I, I have loved it ever since. Wonderful. You know, Teach for Hawaii, I'm sorry, Teach for America is often a two year program. And so I understand what made you come. What made you stay? What made me stay? Um, well, I came here with Teach for America, not exactly like most of the members of Teach for America. So most of the members of Teach for America are straight out of undergrad. Um, you know, they want to have experience, you know, to be able to put maybe on their resumes as they, um, you know, go off to do other things. Um, but I had already been out of undergrad. I had already finished with my master's and actually I was I had been teaching for two years already in uh, North Carolina, back in my hometown. Um, and that's why I learned about the program. Some teachers were placed in uh, the area of my hometown to teach because it, it's a high needs area. And so I learned about the program from them and I decided to apply because, you know, I, again, was fascinated and, and, you know, excited about the prospect of learning a different place, let alone Hawaii. Um, and what kept me here was the relationships that I was able to build with people here. Um, I have such a feeling of ohana. The school community has embraced me and I, I feel very grateful and humbled and, and lucky um, to have been able to cultivate those relationships throughout my time here. 
Yeah, it is all about relationships and education. So tell us, I understand you have a master's in Spanish. What exactly uh, do you teach at Waipahu High School? I teach Spanish at Waipahu High School. Okay. Yeah. I teach mostly Spanish, but um, as of year before last, I also began teaching natural resources core. Um, and so that's a class kind of like a freshman seminar for our freshmen who are in our natural resources academy here at Waipahu High School. So Waipahu High School is um, wall to wall academies. Each student, each and every student is a part of some academy or another. Um, and so um, I work with our natural resources academy students, namely the freshmen. Okay. So you've had the opportunity to watch students matriculate from ninth grade to senior year and beyond in six years. So yes. what has that experience been like for you to see that process take place here? It's been a bit surreal and rewarding. It's, it's amazing to see students flourish and figure out what they want to do with their lives. Um, it's a privilege to be a part of that. Um, I was also the class of 2019 um, student class advisor. And so, you know, that class, they were my babies. They were my heart. Um, I think about them often. I think about the moments that we have. Um, so, you know, following them from freshman year up into graduation is just an experience, emotional roller, roller coaster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been amazing to recognize names and recognize that I have the, the brothers or the cousins of certain students and, you know, to build that connection that way, again, with the, the relationships that I've been able to build. Yeah, so, wonderful. Yeah, it's again, you keep saying the key term relationships and when you build those relationships, it's amazing to watch them grow. Now, coming from North Carolina, can you talk about some of the similarities and differences uh, between that public education system that I'm assuming you matriculated through and what you see here? Hmm. Well, if I'm gonna talk about the differences that I see, I also have to acknowledge um, just time. There, there are some things that you know, are available to students in general, whether it's here in, or in North Carolina, um, that were just not available when I was going to school. Um, one thing here at Waipaku High School, the students have been fortunate enough to be able to um, graduate with associate's degrees even before they've graduated um, with their, their high school diplomas. And that's because we have a pretty, um, pretty good early college system here. And when I was going to high school back in North Carolina, that kind of thing was you know, pretty much just getting started up. And I was fortunate enough to be able to take a college English class when I was in high school, but it was nothing like being able to, to get your associate's degree before you graduate high school. Um, so that's a difference. Um, as far as the school system, academies, are big here. I would say, as far as I know right now, they're bigger here um, than in North Carolina. And certainly when I was going through high school, um, I wouldn't have known what an academy was, especially in the sense um, that we know it now um, as, as far as career readiness and, and college readiness, et cetera. But yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. It does, it does. It gives us some insight um, as to what the differences are, a lot of times people will say, uh, will ask, how is it different, better or worse, uh, for many people who are coming from the continent as opposed to people who have only taught here or did not attend school here. So it's good to hear. Okay. Yeah. So you and I recently participated in a discussion. Well, you participated as a panelist and I was an observer. And you were talking about African-Americans in the school system here. And it was such a wonderful conversation. 
And I wanted you to touch on some of the highlights of that conversation as it pertains to, well, first, tell us the group that you are the advisor for, and then explain to us how that came to be. Absolutely. Um, so I am, I have the privilege of being the advisor for Waipahu High School's Black Cultural Club. Um, and it's the first of its kind here at Waipahu. And I don't know of any others anywhere. I'm, I'm certain there might be, but um, I don't know of any um, right off the top of my head. So that club, that group came about because um, one day last year during Club Rush, a group of students, they noticed that there were booths for you know, sports and, and other interest clubs. And among those things, uh, cultural clubs. And so they saw clubs for Spanish, they saw clubs for Korean, they saw clubs for Chinese and, and Filipino and Polynesian and Hawaii, um, Hawaiian. And they thought to themselves, all of these cultures are represented, but we're not represented. And so what happened was they went to another teacher um, here at Waipahu High School, um, I'm gonna give him a shout out by name, Trevor Lau. Um, they went to him and what he told them was that they it would be more appropriate if they were to find a teacher, especially because one um, or two are available here at Waipaku High School. We don't have very many um, teachers that identify as African-American, but uh, we're about two or three here. And so he, he suggested to the students that they come and reach out to one of us. And he told them, um, since he knew that I was the advisor for the class of 2019 and, and I enjoyed doing that um, and being there in that capacity for the students, um, he, he suggested that they come and speak to me. And so during lunch that day, I was just out and about. I wanted to go and check out the club rush as well, see what all the clubs were up to. And I came back to my classroom and I was so surprised to see them there. I, it's on campus, you see maybe one black student here, maybe one black student there, and they're just, you know, all over the place. But when I came back to my classroom, there was a group of maybe, I don't know, 10, 10 or 15 of them, which may seem like a small number, but um, given that you know, at Waipahu High School, the black student population is about 1% of the whole population of about 2,800 students. So that gives us about 28 black students. Um, right. going off statistics. You know, 10 or, or 15 students is pretty significant out of, out of that group. Uh, and so I thought to myself, wow, <laughs> all the black students on campus must be here right now at this right. point. It was the first time I had ever seen that. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I opened my classroom door and I invited them in and, and they explained to me what they were thinking. Hey, we see all these clubs, but we don't see anything for us. We don't see ourselves represented. And when they explained that to me, as you and I were saying, um, you know, before this started, it's it just made me feel so good that they you know, they recognize that for themselves. Actually, the truth of the matter is, is that something like that, a black student club, a black um, student alliance, black cultural club, that was something that I had been very interested in doing, you know, almost since I've been at Waipaku High School, but I didn't want that to come from me. I wanted that to come from the students. I wanted them to, to, um, you know, to want to be a part of something like that. And so um, I was very happy that they came to, to, to seek me out, to reach out to me. And so we got the club started. Um, I've, I wanna go ahead and shout out um, Joyce Brumble, Spanish teacher, another Spanish teacher here at Waipahu High School who's um, been super supportive. Tanya Harris, Japanese teacher who identifies as African-American. Um, who's been super supportive. Um, Rebecca Sanborn, Rebecca Sanborn, our Kumu Olelo Hawaii here, our um, Hawaiian language teacher, 
just so many people have been super supportive of the club. Wonderful. So it sounds like it was very organically created and then that the students had the foresight to do it. So are they taking lead roles in the development of the group and activities that you'll do? Um, so the short answer to that question is yes. And I say yes, because I'll have to put that for the moment um, in the past tense, because last school year, we were having our meetings and we had president, vice president, um, secretary, all those things. And they would help me to seek out uh, activities going on in the community and ways that they could um, participate and, and just uh, impact the community. And so, yes, they did have um, a sort of a say in that way. But then COVID-19 hit and, um, you know, contact was, was difficult to maintain. Um, some students moved away, some graduated during that time. Um, and so at this point right now, I am, you know, as the advisor, I'm working to figure out how to build, you know, the club back up um, to what it was, especially now that we're, we're going to be distance learning um, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah. So I want, we'll get to the distance learning in just a little bit, but Considering the um, influences um, that you can easily see here in Hawaii from Black culture, especially hip hop culture, talk to us about the intent of the group. Is it to make others aware of that or is it just for the group members to embrace Black culture more? It is both of those things and, and you know, I envision it being sort of an empowerment for those students to go out and share and educate um, about the culture. Um, one of the things that always came up was like you said, the students themselves, they recognize that um, students, just general culture here, um, they engage in what we might perceive as, as black culture, you know, the hip hop. <laughs> and the, the dress and, and the, the way of speaking. Um, and so they recognize that. Um, they, they also recognize, you know, that students also engage in things like the use of the N word um, without knowing exactly the history of that and where it comes from, but they know it because of popular culture, right? Um, and so our, our Black Cultural Club students, they recognize this and that that was one of the things that that kind of motivated them to want to educate people about, you know, what it means to be Black, you know, in the world and also specifically here in Hawaii. Uh, and that is something that I am also passionate about myself. So at the end of our conversation today, I'll ask you, what does it mean to you to be Black in Hawaii? But before we get to that question, I want to talk a little bit about distance learning. Um, we, as the DOE, or as a nation, could not have known that it was coming to this. Um, but we got there. And I think we made it through, uh, certainly made it through. Some of us had greater success than others, right? Now we've had the entire summer to prepare for the possibility of distance learning again, and it's inevitable, it's happening for you. Talk to us about your process of transitioning and what that will look like as the school year starts for you tomorrow, right? Okay. Yes. Um, so honestly, there, there are still lots of things uncertain, yeah. uh, but as you said, we've had some time to prepare, um, certainly in the last two weeks as we've kind of pushed back the return of students to school, whether that's face-to-face -face or um, on virtual platforms. We've had that time to be able to, you know, watch videos and 
and participate in, in professional development and learn from each other as teachers. Um, and so certainly I have engaged in all of those things. Um, over the summer, my time was busy spent with participating, you know, I, I've always been, you know, a, a lover of cultures and languages and everything. And so over the summer, I engaged in Portuguese language class, <clears throat> Hawaiian language class, Japanese language class, um, and French language classes. And that was, the purpose of that was twofold. One, again, I love languages and cultures and any opportunity I get to learn them, I like to take them. But also, it gave me the opportunity to look at those classes through the lens of a teacher and, hey, this is probably what my classes are gonna look like at the start of the school year this year. And so I would take notes and, and really pay attention um, through that lens to possible things that I could incorporate into my classroom. And um, it was a good experience for me. Also for the natural resources thing, I uh, participated in Malama Learning Center's field school, shout out to them. Um, they do a lot in the community to educate students about what it means to uh, be sustainable and and uh, malama aina to take care of the land and everything so i was engaged in 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 you know classes with students in in that capacity and so i i kind of learned some techniques for my natural resources students um do i feel like i am ready for this start of the school year I'm excited, certainly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and today just working on finalizing things for my Google Classroom, um, familiarizing myself with different technologies that we're going to be using, uh, uh, you know, Google extensions for our meets and, and different language learning things. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's exciting to learn how to do these new things to um, you know, possibly revolutionize what education looks like, not just now, but in the future, how can we use these things once we go fully face-to-face -face again, right? So. Yeah, yeah, because you know, one of the things I noticed um, and that I had the opportunity to share with a parent, um, because I too share that excitement. I, I, I'm excited as a teacher and a learner, um, the learning never ends. And so I was explaining to a parent what the process would look like for this week. And I think my letter was very encouraging, but it was also very enthusiastic and reassuring that we're gonna do our best to remain safe, but we're gonna plunge right through this because this, this is history in the making. And one day, years down the line, we're gonna tell our children what we were doing during the pandemic, children, grandchildren, generations to come will say, where were you during the pandemic of 2020? Mm -hmm. And some of us will say we were teaching, doing exactly what we love, what we were born to do, what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. And I could not think of anything else I'd rather be doing. Um, and it seems as though you feel the same way. So. Absolutely. Yeah, the infighting, some would call it infighting. I just say it's a lot of renegotiation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the key word that, um, there are several key words. You know, I saw a meme the other day that talked about all the phrases that we're hearing as in education right now, unprecedented times, right? Be flexible, <laughs> adjust, <laughs> adjust, right? And so yeah. all these words are very true uh, to life as to what's happening to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think that it's remarkable how teachers have um, been able to adapt and readapt and um, the so-called renegotiations that we're referring to with our HSTA and so on and so forth. It's kind of... Um, like saying, okay, I understand what you're doing. Let's put that in this box over here. And I'm going to stay in my lane and focus on what I do best. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you've done that. You've prepared, 
now I want to ask you though, um, first of all, I have to thank you. Um, thank you for being an educator for one. And thank you for being an African-American male educator. Uh, when I was working on my Mac, yes, indeed. When I was working on my master's degree, I put an emphasis on the disproportionate amount of black male boy or children placed in special ed. And then the lack of black educators in general, but especially the need for the black male educator. So you are needed here and we appreciate you being here. Please tell me, what does it mean to you to be African-American teacher here in Hawaii? What it means to me to be an African-American teacher here in Hawaii. Um, I think that it is an opportunity for people to get to know me, um, Number one, as a person, and number two, as a Black person, an African-American person, um, there, there are so many ways that, you know, we as Black people are, are portrayed in the media. Um, as I said before, the music that people listen to, they, they hear these things and they see these things and they think that that is what being Black is. Um, but every opportunity to get to know personally, um, on an intimate level, an actual living Black person um, is, is something that can be valuable. And I think that um, my presence has been valuable to you know, my students. They can say now, I've had a black male teacher. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And for that, I think that is the perfect way to close, to simply say that your students can say that, lots before them could not possibly say that. Thank you for being an example of the best of us. And I hope that you will continue to do that. I know that I'll have you back here again at times and um, keep doing what you're doing. And tomorrow I wish you a very happy first day of school online. <laughs> Thank you. Much success to you and your cakey as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've been watching Crossroads in Learning and we hope that we will see you again. I've been your host, Keisha King. We want to thank our special guest today, Kevin Sledge. Until next time, aloha.